Well, hello everyone. It's uh, lovely to be here with you. Uh, a great pleasure. And uh, in a sense, this is uh, part two of a, uh, a long session uh, looking at governance principles uh, for church councils. My name is, let me give you a bit of an introduction. My name is Tim Hine, and um, I'm currently on faculty at uh, Uniting College for Leadership and Theology. Um, I'm a Uniting Church minister. I've ministered in a couple of different congregations, uh, in a church plant in another congregation, uh, Hope Valley Uniting, and uh, have been involved in some other organisations uh, in ministry as well, quite diverse, and uh, also have been involved in uh, consulting on strategic planning and governance principles uh, with an organisation called Capacity Builders, working with Christian organisations and whatnot. Um, I've also uh, been on the board of a few different organisations, including one of our Uniting Church schools, Seymour College, uh, and have uh, done the Australian Institute of Company Directors, Company Directors course as well. So I come to talk to you a bit today because of a real interest in uh, governance. Uh, I come not with any particular expertise, but a bunch of experiences because I've been really fascinated and really quite interested in governance principles and um, have, have not just worked with church councils, but with boards of organisations and, and, uh, and other committees of that kind of governance nature. And so it's some of that expertise that I'll try and bring uh, to you today and some principles that I hope are really applicable. Uh, what would be helpful for me is to, to be reminded, uh, which of you have were at the last session, last time we had one of these days? Okay, so a couple of you were, and the majority of you weren't. Okay, so the, what we're going to do today, I, what I'm going to move across is some information that will be relevant and easy to understand and applicable, even if you weren't at the last session. That last session, however, is um, up on YouTube, and you can see we're filming today as well. So I'm going to go into that new information so that it's a nice part two for the other information that's on YouTube. But then if we have time at the end, uh, what we'll do is not just some Q&A uh, around some questions you might have, but then also I can come back and do some of those principles if we have enough time and if it's of particular interest and relevant to the questions that you have. Okay, So I hope that's... Uh, that's nice and, and clear. Why don't I say a word of prayer just to begin, uh, if just for myself, if nothing else, but certainly to ask the Lord's <laughs> blessing on our time. Loving and creative God, you are so wise. We see the way you create, the way you um, operate, the way you save the world, the way you're at work. You are truly a God who looks ahead and holds time in your hand and is so wise and calls us to be stewards. So, Lord God, I pray now as we spend this hour exploring stewardship in leadership and in governance of our communities, that you would guide my words, but also by your spirit would guide uh, where that's landing uh, in people's minds and hearts in their situations here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, where we really got up to in the last session uh, was coming to this particular area here looking at four major areas that are the responsibility um, of organisations uh, and their governance groups. And we went through a whole bunch of principles around how that works and what the difference is between governance and management. So the leadership and management of an organisation, but then the governance. So the difference between the ministry leadership and the ministry teams in the church and the church council who have a governing overarching kind of role. Like I said, I'm not going to go back over that, but I want to just delve into that and say that we looked at the fact that there are four key areas which are the purview, if you like, of that governance group. And so for our context, we're talking about a church council. We're talking about the fact that they should be involved in strategic formulation. Now, that's a very sort of business-like corporate term, but what it basically means is they should be asking the question, what are we going to do? What is the church here to do? It's the big picture question. What really are we here to do? And, and that is an absolutely key question. If I can go back one slide, I'll... Uh, let me push it. Maybe it's one slide forwards. I have a quote here from C.S. Lewis, which I read last time, and it's worth reading again because I think he captures the essence of what we say we're here to do. He says, it's so easy to think that the church has a lot of different objects or purposes. He says, education, buildings, missions, holding services. But really the church exists for no other purpose but to draw people to Christ, to make them little Christs. If they're not doing that, then all the cathedrals and all the clergy and all the missions and the sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. 
God became man for no other purpose. It's even doubtful whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. That God calls us to make us like himself, draws us in and says, I have made you and you have fallen, but I will redeem you and you are part of my family. So to transform people and communities and redeem them and make them like Jesus. That's a way of articulating the very essence of why the church exists. But that's that top question. Uh, what are we going to do? And I went into that in detail last time, so we're going to just skip over that. But secondly, we're going to get to policy making. Policy making is also the purview of the church council. And while policy kind of sounds again like a corporate term, essentially what I mean by that is you need to be thinking about what are our boundaries and standards. In other words, Whilst we've worked out what we're here to do, to build the church, to grow the church, to bless our community, whatever that happens to be, uh, it's your responsibility to decide that. But then to take a step further and say, what are the boundaries and standards by which we're going to do that? We're not just going to you know, throw paint at a wall and hope it sticks. We want to plan. We want to ask questions about the nature of what we are going to do, how we're going to do it. And particular, what are the standards? And some of those standards you'll see are ethical standards. Churches need to embrace the fact that there are certain things we will do and certain things we will not do. It's not going to be whatever we can do just to get to the end. There are certain standards that we have. And we'll come back to that. The third thing we're going to realise is that church councils need to embrace uh, monitoring and supervising executive activities. What that basically means is, is it being done? <laughs> so it's not just we're going to do this and then we just every year say, well, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do. At some stage, the church council looks and evaluates and says, did we do it? Have we done it? How are we going? And we'll look at that in some detail and some practical ways how you can do that. And number four, it's about accountability to God and the congregation. The church council has a role of accountability. Yes, to God. And so there's very much a dis spiritual discernment role involved in a church council. You're sitting and you're, si you're praying. You're asking God to guide you. But also there's a sense by which are we doing things, what God has called us to do. But there's also a role of accountability to the congregation, reporting back obviously to the congregation. And in the Uniting Church, that's a very important thing. It's the congregation that obviously elects uh, the church council and so there's an, a role of accountability back to the congregation in terms of what we're doing and of course to the broader church as well and we talked a bit about that in the last session so those are four key areas thinking about as a church council what are we going to do what are our boundaries and standards is it being done and our accountability in it to God and to the congregation that's the essence of, of what I want to explore now Last time, I spent quite a bit of time, and this is the last thing we did in the final session, was looking at what are we going to do. And that's determining the values and the mission and the vision. And so we looked at the values, things that we won't compromise, but what are the values of our congregation? Uh, what's our mission, our purpose? What are we called to do as a congregation? We can't do everything, so what are we going to do? And then we looked at the vision. That is, what's that going to look like if we do it? looking at the future. So being a person, and then Sharon talked about the fact that there are many different types of personalities and people adopt the different hats uh, in those situations. And some people are future oriented. They love the ideas in the future. And this comes really easy to them. But their gift to the congregation, uh, to the church council is helping us all to spend some time on that. It's not all we do, but to spend some time on that and thinking about the kind of church that you're called to be. And that brings us to where we are for today, which is to start off on policy making. What are our boundaries and standards? What I want to do through these is I want to look at how a church council can, can ask and investigate these areas and be really competent in them. Uh, and then we're going to look at some hallmarks of some unhealthy church council behaviour, which is kind of fun and you might smile and resonate and already you are. <laughs> and uh, this might be a bit of a mirror this session. And, um, and then we're going to look at some healthy habits and healthy distinctives of, of church councils. So I hope that's really relevant and we'll see how far we get uh, with it. 
Please feel free to interrupt me throughout and, and ask questions and let's make this um, nice and, and relevant and interactive. So here we go. A church council needs to be thinking through, to be involved in healthy governance, what their boundaries and standards are. What that means at the very basic level is that the church council should model the best culture of the church, our best selves. What that means is that the church council, in a sense, should be a reflection of the congregation, almost like a sample of the congregation, but it should be aspiring to embody out the best selves of the congregation. How many know that, that organisations and churches as well have personalities and cultures, just like our nation of Australia has a culture and just like some families have a particular culture? Churches have a culture as well. And that culture can sometimes be unhealthy and sometimes it can be healthy, it can be different, but it will be distinctive because of the di different people that are in it. Part of the role of a church council is to help shift the culture, to improve the culture, to grow the culture. And so there's a sense by which if the church council has made some calls and, and discernment about this is what we're going to do and this is where we're going to go and these are the things that we're going to do, then it needs to be modelling uh, the best selves of the congregation. If part of the role of the co church council is to be ensuring that it's a healthy congregation, it needs to itself be a healthy church council. It needs to be doing that itself. In other words, they should operate in a way that they would like to see the entire congregation operate. If, if gossiping is an issue in the life of the congregation, then the first step in resolving that is for the church council to not be a gossiping little community in itself. So actually determining as a church council, we covenant to be our best selves. We covenant to be confidential. We covenant to uh, not bring hidden agendas. But we, we covenant to uh, speak honestly and fairly. And we'll look at some of those things later. But there's a decision that says we want to operate with a health and a respect and an equality and a, and a love and a patience and a kindness to each other that we would like to actually see embodied in all of our congregation and obviously, eventually, in all of our community around about us. And that takes a deliberate decision. That doesn't accidentally happen unless you have a whole bunch of really mature people coming together. And even really mature people can be a little bit strange when they come together. So what you need to do is decide what kind of culture do we want to have? What are, what are, when someone comes into our organisation, into our church council, sorry, into our church, what do we want them to feel and sense? We want it to be a generous place, or we want it to be a really friendly place, or we want it to be a thoughtful place. Uh, we, what is it? Actually having a conversation about the kind of culture that you want to have is incredibly important. There's a very famous saying that goes around that says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. What that means is you can have all the best strategy on paper of the things you want to do, but at the end of the day, where you end up will be primarily about the culture that you have. It's not just the things you've got on paper. It's the way you relate to one another, the vibe of the thing, to quote the great Australian film, The Castle. What's the vibe of the church? What's the culture that we have? And there's a sense of unity and prayerfulness in the midst of that. And so there should be a sense of clarity on what that culture is theologically and culturally. Theologically and culturally. What I'm saying is that you need to decide. Do an exercise where you actually talk about what you believe the culture is of the church and what you would like it to be. What parts would you like to see improved and redeemed? Now, I'm making an assumption here that's a really important assumption, and that's this, that the church council is a place where careful and frank conversation can occur. It needs to be. One of the reasons why you need to have a culture, a healthy culture in the church council, is you need to be able to handle having candor in your conversation. It doesn't mean someone just spilling their guts all over the place or being, this is what I think. No, you've got to be a listening, discerning culture because you need to be able to handle, you know what? I think this is a weak spot in our church or I believe this is part of our culture that isn't Jesus-like. And so... Tim, the clear of theology, I mean, oh. we, we might say that we're an inclusive um, group as far as who comes to... 
to worship. Yes. But to say we're inclusive theologically in the sense of um, uh, a homosexual minister wouldn't be theologically true. So sometimes we use words when we describe our theology, which can be quite confusing if people have certain understandings of the word. That's right. That's a very good question. Let me hold that for 30 seconds and, and finish my thought on, on the culture, and I'll come to that. What I simply want to say is, one time when I had a church culture, a church council, we were thinking about what kind of culture do we want to have? And we thought, you know what, at the end of the day, it's about Jesus. And so we came up with a phrase, which, that is, we want the culture of our church council to be reflective of the personality of Jesus. And so that kind of kept it in our mind. What's Jesus like? Because essentially, I mean, you can look at it and say this, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, is the fruit of the Spirit of Christ. This is Jesus' personality coming by the Spirit. So a way of describing it is to say, you know what? If our church council was kind of one person, we'd want it to be Jesus and his personality. It's just a way of keeping that reflection. Is that what's going on? Because I've been in church councils <laughs> that were very, very different. Some meetings, and it's like, whoa, that's tough. But it can be tough. You can have a robust conversation. Jesus had robust encounters with people, but he was still, of course, loving, willing to die for them, serving them, and all that. So that can be a way of deciding. We want our culture to be reflective of Jesus' personality. Um, that can be a helpful way. Or you might find another way of describing it. Coming to the theological clarity, that's really important. And sometimes we don't want to talk about that as a church council because sometimes some of us are nervous about where we even stand personally on something. Sometimes we know that in that church council there are different perspectives on some parts of theology as well. But in a church, sometimes what we do is we try and sublimate or we escape having the conversation by simply saying we're an inclusive church. Now, that's very legitimate to say. I would just say it's inadequate. You've got to go further than that. You don't always, in the life of the congregation, get up and have to preach on explicitly how inclusive you are and what you are. I mean, you need some sense of principles around that. You know, you do believe in some things. Everyone's not universally inclusive. It is a Christian church, after all. But wherever you happen to stand on those things, there should be some clarity on it, particularly in the church council meeting. The church council meeting needs to be able to say, we say we're inclusive. What that specifically means is that we allow people and welcome them into fellowship who have different beliefs on this issue and this issue. We have some people on our church council who may believe this and who may believe this in good conscience, as matters of conscience under, under God. That's where they stand. But a lot of the time, a lot of the tension in a church council can come from the fact that it's never really explicitly stated it's just this vague notion. And so no one really quite knows when they're on dangerous ground or when they're not on dangerous ground. Does that make sense? So you end up having this issue in the middle of the room, that, an elephant that no one ever talks about. And you need someone to say, you know what? What this means is this. Some of us stand here on this and some of us stand here on this and some of us just don't know. And that's okay. That's where we stand. And we're reflecting our congregation. Or you need to be able to say, you know what? As a church council... Um, we all feel we all stand here on this theological issue, but we're aware there are people in our congregation who have a very different view. Now, how are we as a congregation going to manage the fact that we want them to feel incredibly loved and welcome while not compromising where we stand on it? So you see, what I'm saying is you need to have the conversation about those things. That the church council needs to be the safe place where that conversation happens. It's not wrong to unpack those things and in the Uniting Church, we live in a microcosm of the broader church, which is very, very diverse. And it's not wrong to explore that diversity and talk about it. You need to have some sense of clarity. Because until you have some sense of clarity on where you stand on these particular matters, everyone will feel uneasy all of the time. And you'll never actually get around to doing mission. You'll just forever be worried about where we all stand on things. And, and things, the adversity will pop up at the worst possible moment. Because you don't have a knowledge. What I find is that I have friends across the theological spectrum in the life of our church. And I sit with them and laugh with them. And the intimacy of the friendship is built on the fact that we know we disagree. And so there's no sort of, oh, I hope I'm not going to scare you. You know, that. you know what I mean? You can move past that. That's what the culture you need to have in your church council. 
because your congregation will feel nervous about those things and you need to make sure that the minister in the church council isn't nervous about those things because you've had the conversation and you allow that to be something that is talked about with, with candour and care. Are there any questions on that last point before I move on? I touched a bit about it in terms of the values, but there are things within the life of your church council you need to say, we are responsible for setting that culture. We want to be this kind of church, and so therefore we need to be this kind of church council in what we do. Let me make one more observation before I move on. Often a congregation is faced with a, a choice... Um, between two competing values. One of them might be um, inclusion and the other one is excellence. Now, when I say inclusion, I mean it in a different way to the way which we've just used in our conversation. But what I mean is, are we going to be a congregation where we give everyone a go to do things in the life of the church and realise that that means some people are going to do things that they're not very good at? <laughs> Or are we going to be a congregation where we have a certain standard of excellence and professionalism about the way we do things? Now this can be, the classic example of this is in the area of worship, a worship team. Do you want your worship team to be a paid person who plays with excellence and that person or those persons do it because there's a certain standard of how to use the organ or how to use the band and the sort of sound we want to have, that we want to have quality about it so that a person who comes in from the community doesn't go, oh well, typical daggy church, doing everything that's falling apart. You know what I mean? They actually want to be encountered by worship that lifts the spirit and glorifies God in, in that particular way. Or do you want to be a congregation who has a culture of, you know what, if you've had two lessons on the guitar, get on up here because we just love you and want to have you involved and it's a place where you can have a go at anything. Now that might seem like a funny little example, but it's a really important decision to make and it's a cultural decision. Do we want to have a culture where anyone can come and be involved in things, stick up your hand and we'll get you involved and all that and sometimes if you're a smaller congregation, that's just necessity. Or do you want to make a deliberate decision to say, you know what, every week it feels like the, church, the worship service is just kind of getting there and falling apart. We actually want to go to another level in the way we organise and plan. We want to have some quality uh, in the way we do things. And that's a deliberate cultural decision. That we say, actually, you know what, you don't get to just, Bob doesn't get to sing up the front every week just because Bob likes to sing. Uh, we're going to have people who actually, it's somewhat pleasing to the ear to see it. Not just to God's ear, but to our ear as well. So that's a decision. Now that's just a, now, Wendy, am I right? This is a deliberate decision. <laughs> Wendy's been a worship leader. So that's a deliberate cultural decision. What kind of culture do we want to have? Uh, is this going to be a culture where we invite kids to be making noise and there's mess and all sorts of things going on in the worship service because our culture is that everyone's welcome and the kids are welcome and it's wonderful to be here? Or do we want to have a congregation of a culture where, you know what, the kids are well taken care of in a program specifically for them and everyone, you know what I mean? We're going to have a, a congregation where folks who are, um, uh, who are elderly, I can't hear properly and all the rest of it are going to be able to hear what's going up the front better without being disturbed. Again, that's a cultural decision. And your church council, with your minister, as part of the church council, needs to make a decision about those things. What I'm inviting you to do really is to say, don't just allow whatever goes to just whatever go. Be deliberate about the things that you do as a church council and have the conversation. Even if you say, you know what, we've got different views. We haven't quite come to an agreement on this. Let's revisit it again. Let's come back to it again. At least you're having the conversation. In the life of the church, that conversation needs to be happening somewhere. And the church council is the place to have it. All right, let's keep moving on. The second area, or the third area rather, that a church council needs to be involved in well is the monitoring and supervising activities. In other words, actually looking and understanding what's being done. The church council should hold a very clear understanding of reality, where the church is at. Now this again goes to my point that you need to be honest. Where are we at? Where are we at? Not, not in, in a, where were we 30 years ago. 
The church council needs to be not in love with where the church was 30 years ago. The church council is the custodian of the present and the future of the church and its mission. So it, you need to ask the question, where are we at? Now, whether that's how many people are coming, what are we doing well, what are our blind spots, where, what are things that we need to improve, it needs to be a place where you, to use a phrase, interrogate reality. Where exactly are we at? Where exactly are we at? And it needs to ensure it has processes for measuring if the congregation's mission is being fulfilled. This time last year, we said that we were going to do this stuff in the neighbourhood. Did we do any of it? Oh, we had a bit of a go. Well, how did it go? Who did we impact? Where? How? It's not being negative, it's being honest. Letting your yes be yes and your no be no. You know what I mean? Looking and saying, the church council needs to be a place of honest evaluation of where things are at. And so once again, it needs to be a grace-filled, loving environment where the truth can be told. It should also be taking the temperature of the congregation's culture as well. And I think that's helpful. One time in a church council, we spent a good 10 minutes every time in our meeting just saying, what's going on with the congregation in terms of our culture? How are people relating to one another? Is there discord? Are there any things that we're hearing around the place? It's like taking the temperature of the congregation and the culture. Say, well, there's a bit of, you know, there's some stuff going on here or there's been stuff. And it's like, just it may not be our job to fix it or, or, or anything, but we need to be aware of it, aware of it. So taking the pulse of the congregation. Also talking about positive things. Like wasn't it see, fantastic so-and-so initiated that we should do this or so-and-so when they shared that prayer in church. That just shifted something. They said it so well in their prayer or what they shared. That shifted our culture a little bit. And then actually saying, isn't that wonderful? We want to see more of that. We need to be growing in that particular value or just having that conversation. The minister should be guiding and leading in that conversation as part of the church council, but you need to be having that conversation so that you know at any time what the culture is. You could describe the congregation uh, really, really well, as well as where, where it's going. Are there any questions on that one, that sense of evaluation? I, I, I want to say... Some church councils, all they do is evaluation and, and some do nothing. There's always one issue there that's always of, of, of importance that everyone wonders whether we should be measuring it or not. And that's the, the question of numbers. <laughs> how many were here? <laughs> how many were here? How many are members of the church and how many have been coming? I would say to some degree, numbers aren't everything. Of course, the church isn't just simply about growing bigger. Uh, its mission is a little bit more substantial to that. But I think numbers... They are important because numbers ref represent, um, well, the image of God. How many images of God are we engaging with? It, numbers are important. Our community is large and we're here to do something not just for ourselves. So being honest about those things, of not just where the finances are, but where, where our, uh, what it is that we, we are in attendance at, or engagement missionally with our community as well because there are numbers who are here on a Sunday then there are numbers who have been impacted by our church during the week and all these other things you should be honest about them what are they and then be honest about what do we want to see happen here do we want to see grow by 25 percent the difficulty is you've got to understand and this is the overall point that I'm making you can't manage what you don't measure you need to me measure things in order to manage them now, you may make a strategic decision that says, we don't care who comes. If there's one person here, then we're fulfilling our mission. I'd say, well, okay, if that's what you think is a good stewardship of your building and your time and what you're here for, but at least measure it. Did you get one person? What you measure, you can manage. You can manage. And so interrogate reality and, and, um, and ask, is it being done? Part of that, of course, is about the, the, the minister as well. The minister, it's very important to remember, in the Uniting Church, doesn't work for the church council. You are not their employer body. The presbytery of the Uniting Church is the, if you like, employer body. Um, they are a member of the church council and they serve the church with the church council. So they are there not to, not to lord it over the church council and they are not there to be submissively under the church council. Um, they are, uh, they work with the church council and sometimes they facilitate a lot of the church council sometimes they chair the church council that's not very often but there is a sense by which they are there 
um, as, as a person working with the church council. However, it's very appropriate that they be uh, giving some kind of report as to where they think the church is at and also personally how they think that their, their role is going and what they've been doing and all that. Yeah, that that's the area that I find most difficult. Yeah, yeah. And that is that the minister provides a report and quite often the church council thinks it's rubbish. However, because we're not the employer, we can't actually engage in discussion about you're doing the wrong thing. <coughs> and and if yeah, so there's an area there, why do they report if they don't actually are responsible to it? So that's that it, it just doesn't make sense to me that they should even write a report. It depends what they're writing a report of. In other words, I don't want to know um, what they've done. In other words, if someone's working for me, um, there's a sense by which I want to make sure that they're doing the job. I, I, as a church council, I'm not that interested if they're doing their job in, in the sense that, in other words, I, I would never want to set up a culture where my minister ne feels they need to be keeping a timesheet. You know what I mean? I did this at 9 o'clock, this at 10 o'clock, this 11 o'clock to make sure they're doing their hours. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in a minister doing their hours. I'm interested in um, their job, which is in terms of what's happening with the congregation and what's going on with them personally in terms of health. So what I, what I want them to report is not, here are all the things that I did, what I want to, because I'm not, I'm not employing someone to do the ministry, I'm employing someone to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So I want them to report on how the congregation's going from their opinion. So when I ask, the, when I ask, when I, when I want a, a, con a, a minister to report, I want you to report to us how you think we've gone, where we're at, against our mission for the last month. I also want them to report on any pertinent issues they think that we need to be looking at because obviously they'll be the conduit of things that you won't know and see. So that's an important thing. And then I want them to report on how they're travelling personally. In other words, you know what I mean? I want to hear some deep personal reflections that they would share with the church council that they wouldn't share with the whole congregation. You know, are they feeling burnt out? Are they taking their leave? Um, you know, is their marriage in a helpful situation? Those sorts of things that I think that the church council, they need to be reporting on it all the time, but I want to know if there's any red flags and I want to hear them saying, well, you know, what are you reading? What are you um, learning from at the moment? Uh, what are you um, personally doing in your devotions? I'm not keeping them accountable. It's just that I love them and I want to know that that stuff's healthy and I want to give, make sure they feel they have someone to talk to. They have a supervisor, but so I want to hear that. But the most important thing is I'm not, I haven't, we haven't got a minister in order to have a minister do their job and do the ministry for us. We have a minister there to, um, if you like, enable us to do ministry. So I want their report to be on how the church is going. And sometimes if you have a good mission and vision statement then, and values, then you might want them to report against that. In other words, I want your report to be, you know, we said we're going to do these five things. You know, we want to have a culture and worship services that are doing this, this and this and this. Well, your report should be, how do we do that? Because you're the person that we're seeking to guide and lead and facilitate the congregation to do this. So don't tell me everything you've done. Tell me what's going on in the life of the church in that area. Because what the reports we've been getting are, here's the regulations that are under the United Church that I have to do, and this is how I've done all those jobs. I think that's an overly legalistic and defensive way of reporting. I'd say that there was a, without knowing your situation, I'd say that there was a, you need to have a frank conversation about how they're feeling in the congregation and where the congregation, what expectations are at. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I go in as a minister, it's like I'm not here to, you know what I mean? I'm not here to, to clock on and clock off as your minister to do your ministry. I'm here as a, to minister this church by equipping the saints for the work of ministry. So we're all going to do ministry and I'm going to report on how I think we're doing on that. Bruce? One of the things that really concerns me at different times is the lack of understanding of call. Um, ministers are called, are set aside, are ordained, they are, they are there to, to, to be part of but, and, and be separate from at the same time. And I think that um, 
the best thing that we as uh, members of church council would do is to grapple with what it is to be called. Um, it's not a, I mean, you, you, you've used the word job and, and all the rest of it. Yeah. Ministry is not a job. Yes, that, It's not right. a profession. It's not a, it's not a, it's, it, it, it's a call. And it's a, it's a, it's a deep, it, it's what? It's a deep, deep thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that one of the things that we as council members need to try and grapple with is, is that, is that concept of call. Bruce, that's a really wise word, and, and, and that's the important thing, to come back into a conversation like what you're describing there is to say, um, this would happen initially when the, when the minister comes, but it should happen intermittently as well. Why do you think God has called you amongst us as a congregation? And the, and the minister would be saying, why did you call me to come to this congregation? And so there's a sense, if it's all just about the minister and what they're doing, well, quite frankly, they should go and be a, a, a patrol minister or a lone ranger. or do, do you know what I mean? They, they could do that. They don't need a congregation. They're here to enable something within the life of the congregation that you can do together. And, be, and so there's a sense by which um, that, that needs to be clear. And unless a church council is clear on that beforehand, there are some contexts where, uh, the, where you may need a minister and a lot of what they're doing is solo stuff for a while, a pioneering situation. A chaplaincy situation is very much like that, where the minister is offering pastoral care and it's primarily about what they're able to do from person to person or situation to situation. If they're in a congregation with a church council, it's a different situation. If you're hiring a minister or you're calling a minister to simply be here to offer pastoral care to the congregation, you should have clarity about that, but I think that's far less than what a congregation minister is called to do and far less than what I think God would want to see happen within the life of your congregation. Um, another question. I just wanted to um, affirm some of the things you were saying in the question. Um, I think the minister's report is about that, how are we travelling together to achieve the mission yeah. um, and their observations of where things need to be strengthened and how we can sort of um, do each other. I question whether their report should focus on their kind of deep inner stuff about how they're travelling. I think that does fit with the supervisor or a smaller support group in mm -hmm. the life of the church. Because I think the council focus does need to be on what are we doing? Mm -hmm. How are we travelling towards meeting that mission and vision? And what the minister um, is there as a colleague or working with us um, can offer that perspective of the council together. I, no, I take your point. I wouldn't want to emphasise that. I don't think it's a place where they do, you know, deep reflection. I think it's more a case of, I mean, sometimes you've had a minister and they won't put anything about that. And so then you ask the question, and how are you travelling personally? As a, you know, and it's like, well, to be honest, I'm pretty stressed or I'm feeling pretty tired. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's more of red flagging things, not, not deep, deep, you know, that's right. It's not, it, that's what a supervisor is for, not to process it with them. Um, and I take your point. But that's right. I want to be asking the minister... The question I want to be asking of a minister as a church council is not, what were you doing on Thursday afternoon when I spotted you down the shops and you should have been... No, no, no. It's more like, what's happening with our small group ministry? What's happening with our mission team? What's happening... That's what you want to be looking at. Not just on, on you know, as them. As if somehow the church was there for them to have a job rather than the other way around. Bruce, is that a question or you're just... Scratching your ear. Okay, you're allowed to do that. Tim, on the aspect of the church council monitoring that assessing how we're going as a congregation, okay, so they can do that. When's the time to actually say, we're a bit too inside here, we need somebody from outside to help us get bit an overview and assess, are we reading it correctly? Of, um, to help the congregation take a, a, the pulse of itself? Yeah, sort of, I mean, sort of every month the council might say, do that assessment, how do you think the congregation is going? But do they get a bit too, I don't know, focused in on themselves or That's big, ideas, big ideas of what they've achieved when they really haven't achieved it? When's the time to bring in something else? That's a great point. I, I forgot to mention something relevant to that before, and that is it's very important, therefore, for church council members to have a sense of the broader church. In other words, not just 
how we, you know, how do we do things, but go along and, and talk to the chairs of, I mean, at events like this, it's helpful, but go and have a look at other congregations and other worship experiences and other programs. Travel around and see them and get a vision. Oh, okay, they actually do things like this over here. Coming to a session like this is obviously helpful. There's a sense by which governance groups should always be involved in professional development. And you can have that by having someone come in and like Sharon mentioned before, taking the pulse of how you do things. But you can also do that more easily sometimes by members of the church council going elsewhere. Actually going and saying, talking to the church council chair or, or whatever at, at another congregation, maybe another congregation that's at another level, who's already doing some things that you'd like to be doing in a few years time or who are running, you know, 100 people more than you're. It's like, how do they do it? I mean, and ask them. I mean, just frankly ask them, how do you do it? I want to learn or go along to conferences or attend other churches and go, wow, I didn't know it could be done like this. We, I want to see you and your minister. This is one of the most helpful things and healthy things for a church council chair and the minister together to go and visit a whole bunch of different congregations and say, wow, look at this. That's, this is, we want a bit of this. You know, it's just a wonderful thing. I've just come back from a trip where I've been um, speaking at a whole bunch of churches overseas. And each one I was at, I was learning something, going, look how they do that. Fantastic. I've gleaned from that. I would never have thought of that myself. Um, and, and I was talking to one guy, Dan, who's running a particularly effective church. And, uh, and he was saying over lunch, he says, everything we're doing, I've stolen from somewhere else. You know what I mean? He's doing all these innovative things. And he goes, I didn't think of any of, of myself. I got this because I got to that church and I read that book and I got this from here and blow me down, it works. And you, you know what I mean? So you've got to have a sense of the broader church. And that's an important thing, particularly in the Uniting Church, because we're one church as a whole and the congregation isn't an island. So there's a sense by which you'll only be able to monitor if you're doing things any good if you know what good is. Are we doing it well? Are we doing it effectively? What does it mean to do it a different way than we have, have done it before? Um, and you can give that charge to the minister. You can actually say to the minister, you know what? We don't really know. We want to do it. We feel like, you know, this is, we need to do it differently. We don't know what differently looks like. Can you go out and Fine, three different ways, you know what I mean? And bring it back to us so we can grapple with what it means to do this differently or bigger or, or, or new or more precisely. Or, do you know what I mean? You don't know what you don't know and you can't manage it unless you can measure it. So there's a sense by which you need a measuring tape from other congregations and other situations to learn what it is that we could do uh, and how we could do it better. Let me keep moving because we need to get through a bit more. And then lastly, it's, it's about here the, the accountability to God and the congregation and the wider church. Uh, church councils must be a place of total accountability, accepting its responsible role as custodian of the congregation's effectiveness in its mission. It's helpful as a congregation, uh, as a church council rather, to sit there and say, you know what, there's no other group in our congregation sitting around better able to make you know what I mean? These decisions than us. We, you need to own that and say, you know what? It needs to happen with us or it's probably not going to happen. doesn't mean you do everything, but you make the decision. This is what we want to see happen. And then with the minister, who's going to do that? And that's when you start moving into the, if you like, management stuff. The governance is making the decision and grappling with what do we want to do and how do we want to see that happen? The second thing is it must have regular communication processes. Now, this happens in a couple of different ways. The first one is with God. In other words, you've got to pray. <laughs> you've got to pray. And let me say, prayer is... I was so encouraged before when Sharon mentioned about the devotions being an important part. Uh, you don't just get in and get into business, but you actually stop and get that eternal perspective from God. But then also you pray. And, and sometimes you can pray in the meeting as well. You get to a place in the meeting, it's like, you know what, we're, not, we're just going around and around here. We've been spending, you know, 45 minutes now on, on, on whether to have, you know, blue flowers or pink flowers on Sunday. We need to stop and we need to just pray. <laughs> Let's just pause and pray. You sit silent and then pray. And then, and then, well, look, blue it is. Let's go. And then you move on. I'm being a bit facetious. But what I'm saying is you can do that. God will speak to you. He will guide you. And it's okay to stop and to spend that time in prayer. Sometimes as a church council, you might want to have a whole prayer retreat. We want to go away. We're not going to make any decisions. We just want to pray together. We want to pray for our church. We want to pray for our minister. We want to pray for each other. We want to pray for anything that's under the surface amongst us. Just be a praying and discerning community. So that's one. The second one is obviously to the congregation. 
you've got to make sure you always have the trust of the congregation. And the way you have the trust of the congregation is by being honest with them regularly. It doesn't mean that you have to always be reporting on every church council minute you know, that happens or every, every meeting we did this and this and this. You may want to do that. But um, th- there's a sense by which they have the trust that they know they bring things to you. And, and bring things that are not just all dinky die and fantastic. Bring things that are, you know, you can actually say, you know what, as a con- uh, you know, congregation, you have a congregation meeting, the church council is, is feeling, we, we disagree on something and we don't know what to do with it. We love each other, but we keep going around and around on this and we need to report back to you that this is something that we want you to be praying for us as we grapple with it. Um, that's an important thing to do. The congregation can't be seen as this secret group who's always controlling things. There's a sense by which the church council needs to have the trust of the congregation and you do that by having a conduit of information, having nice and clear communication processes. Um, And also to the wider churches as well. And there's a sense by which the churches should be in helpful conversation. Remember that the church council can can call upon the presbytery if it needs to in a particular situation. So we need some help here. We're a bit lost. Can you give us some advice? Can you you send someone down if it gets a bit difficult? So knowing that you're part of a bigger body can be really, really helpful. Or indeed part of the network. The network can help put you in touch with someone who could be of a guide. But also to be some sense of, of accountability as well. And I talked about here, you must pray together and invite God's guidance because you, you are not an island in, in what you're doing. 